Alright. Uh, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for coming to monetizing Android apps in the Play Store. My name is Yash Prabhu. I am a senior software engineer and Android team lead at Drama Fever, an international media streaming company based in New York and Philly. We're hiring like everyone else at DroidCon, so come talk to me if you're interested. We do some awesome media streaming apps. Um, well, we work with AMC as well, so come talk to me. Right. Um, so let's get started. Why are we here? We're all here to make money on the Play Store. So how many of you have apps on the Play Store? Show of hands. Wow. How many of you are making money off of it? So that's great. But um, for those of you who are not making money off of it, I'm going to start talking about how you could go about doing it and what you need to use on the client side and the server side for a monetization solution. So there are seven things we will be learning today, starting from what revenue models you can use, what best fits your use case, and uh, going through what client side API and server side API you should be using and some best practices for implementing this. The first one is revenue models. Uh, so in Google Play Store, you have uh, three revenue models. We'll go in depth into this in a bit. You also have uh, different kind of product types. If you're going with a freemium model, you have two different kind of product types. And the purchase workflow is just a general idea of what this looks like from the client side to the server side. And we're going to make use of the enabling version 3 API on the client side. And uh, we're going to talk about how you would go about testing it. Also, some best practices for security. And lastly, we're going to talk about implementing this on the server side. So first thing you're going to learn, revenue models. So uh, Google differentiates you know, what kind of payment system you can use based on the type of goods. So if it's digital goods, then you would go with these three models, premium, paid, or ad bomb. If it's physical goods, you would go with Android Pay. So freemium is a pricing strategy where apps are available for free to your uh, user uh, once they download it from the Play Store, but certain parts of it are locked. So you could have something like um, a premium TV show on your app that is locked to your users, and they need to pay for it within your app. Remember that when you use a premium model, 30% of it goes to Google. It's the same thing for Amazon and Apple as well. If you go with the freemium model, you have two options, in-app products and subscription. In-app products are those that you pay for one time, and subscription is automated and recurring. So a user just pays for it once, and it recurs for how, how much ever long the user wants it to go for. You also have the paid uh, version, which is when you download it off the Play Store, you have to pay for it. So uh, the good part about freemium is a user gets to try out your app and can decide whether to buy the, free, the premium version of it. Uh, with paid, a user does not have that option. They have to download the app and just uh, pay for it right at the beginning. You also have the option of using AdMob, which is an ad service that Google provides. So you can put in banner ads either on the top or the bottom of your app. Or you could use um, something like video ads or interstitial ads that take over your app when a user wants to you know, do something. Uh, you can use a mix of all of these models, premium, paid, ad, whatever works for you. On the other hand, you have Android Pay, which was introduced by Google in I.O. 2015. It's uh, mostly used for e-commerce, and it's for physical goods. So the rest of this talk is going to focus on the freemium model. And we'll get started first with what kind of product types are out there. So you have two kind of product types, managed, which is for one-time payments. And these are further differentiated into non-consumable and consumable. Non-consumable products are something that you would purchase only once. Uh, for example, unlocking a premium level. And it offers some sort of permanent benefit, and the user does not have to buy it ever again. Consumable, on the other hand, are bought once, but consumed many times. For example, in a car racing game, uh, if your car runs out of fuel, then you can purchase fuel as many times as you want. You also have subscriptions. That's for automated recurring billing. 
you have four options in that. They can be weekly, that is a time period of seven days, monthly, annual, and seasonal. Seasonal products, are, are uh, they have a specific start time and an end time. So you usually use it for sports or holiday seasons. Then um, all of these, except for seasonal, have the option of free trials, which means you can offer this product for free for like a minimum of seven days to a maximum of 30 days. And a user can download the app, play around with it, use all the premium features for about seven, 30 days. And uh, beyond that, they have to pay for it. Seasonal does not give you this because it's only for the start, uh, it only exists between one start date and an end date. Other options you get with subscriptions are manual renewal, which means a user can go in and manually renew the subscription. So if it was renewing on September 1st, if they go in and renew it again, it, uh, the expiration date continues, sorry, the renewal date continues till October 1st. You have another option of upgrade and downgrade, which means a user can move between two uh, different subscription tiers. For example, you could have two products, which is one is $10 a month and the other one is $20 a month, which offers more premium features. So you can uh, let your users upgrade or downgrade depending on what they want to watch. So the, the last option is deferred billing. This is usually used when you if your user fills up an online survey, so it's kind of like a goodwill gesture. So instead of charging them uh, when the renewal period ends, you can just make sure that it's deferred for another month or so. Another thing to note here is even for weekly subscriptions, the free trial minimum date is seven, which doesn't make sense because it's a seven day trial period and you're giving them free trial for seven days. So I've written to Google about it and hopefully they change it to one day. So at Drama Fever, where I work, we use a mix of uh, ad, you know, to generate revenue, we use a mix of ads as well as subscriptions. So we have three subscription tiers. The first one is called Rookie, which has fewer video ads and does not have access to many of the premium features. And then you have Idle, which has no ads, but has access to some of the premium features and has both monthly and annual subscriptions. And you have Superstar, which has no ads and access to all of the premium features. So uh, as you can see, we are generating revenue from both ads as well as subscriptions. So this brings us to the purchase workflow. What does this look like? So now we have an idea of what revenue models to use, what are the products, but how do you start implementing this? So this is the entire workflow. On the left-hand side, you have the uh, client side uh, workflow. So, how this works is when you implement in app billing in your uh, client app and a user hits purchase, a purchase request is sent to the Google Play app. And the Google Play app talks to the Google Play server, sends that request along. And the Google Play server sends that response back through the Google Play app back to your client. So at no point is your app directly talking to Google Play server. It's talking via the Google Play app, which is on a lot of Android devices out there. So once that is done, uh, you, it's up to you to figure out where to store your purchase response, because it's only on the client side, and Google doesn't send you a copy of it. So you can store that on your server. That's up to you. And using uh, you know information from that, you can send it to the Google Play developer API, and that's going to give you more response about your purchase. Another thing to note here is that the Google Play app has uh, stores your information about the user's purchase for about 24 hours, so it's locally cached. Which brings us to what you would use on the client side to implement in-app billing. So know that you'll be using version 3 and not version 2. Version 3 was introduced in 2013 at Google I.O. It's a synchronous uh, purchase workflow, unlike version 2. So at the end of this, if you have uh, an Android app and you have Google Play Store on your device, you should be able to see a screen like this. So for example, I've, I came up with this fragment which lets you buy cheese for 99 a month. So when you hit buy for 9.99 a month, it's going to throw up a dialog which is from Play Store. This is showing fake data, so the price point and everything else is wrong. Uh, so this, this is what you're going to see when you implement in-app billing version 3 API. <coughs> so to get set up, first uh, set up your merchant account. 
since you already have an app on the store, you have um, access to Google Play Developer Console. So you need to set up your merchant account. Next, you need to integrate in that billing uh, API, then define your products, and finally provision the premium content on your app, and then make profit. So to set up your merchant account, go to your Google Play Developer Console, open the Financial Reports tab on the side, and click Set Up a Merchant Account Now. This is going to take you through a workflow uh, in which you can enter your tax information and business information. Next step is to set up in app billing version 3. Go to uh, your SDK manager and download uh, all of these uh, sample files in extras. And uh, copy into your project the in app billing service AIDL file. This is a file that establishes a connection between your client and the Google Play server, so you don't have to write it. And copy all of the Java files in the Trivial Drive Sample app, which you would find in the extra section. Trivial Drive Sample is a car racing app that Google has so that we can get a better understanding of how in-app billing works. So uh, just copy all of the util files in there. So you don't have a jar or a library for this. You just have plain old Java classes and the AIDL file. Next is adding a billing permission into your manifest. You have to make sure you have this, otherwise in-app billing is not going to work. So once it is done, head back to your Google Play Developer Console and copy your public key into your IAB helper.java class. This is a class that you copied from the Trivial Drive sample app. IAB stands for in-app billing. Next step is uh, sign your APK and upload it onto the alpha, beta, or the production channel. Since you're testing this, and it's probably internal, you don't want to put it up on the production channel. So sign it and upload it on the alpha channel. Make sure you hit publish. If you don't hit publish, then it doesn't show up. So hit publish. It will show up in about two hours or so. Once that is done, this is an important step, because your APK has uh, the billing permission, and your APK has the public key information. When you do that, uh, the left side of the Google Play Developer Console will show uh, a tab where you can enter your in-app products. So hit that, and then you can hit, uh, then you can start adding a new product. So if you don't upload your APK at all, that section is disabled. So once you do that, figure out if you want to use a managed product for one-time payments or a subscription for recurring payments, and then use a product ID which is unique. So if you're using something like premium upgrade for a managed product, you cannot use that for a subscription. It is unique. And uh, hit continue, it'll take you to a form where you can enter prices, local prices, price point, dis descriptions, free trials, and all of that. Um, remember once you set up your product and hit activate, there is no way to delete it. So uh, a price point, if it's 99 cents, it's 99 cents forever. If you want to change your price point, you have to create a new product with whatever your new price point is, and then hit activate. So this brings us to what are we going to use on our, uh, we have the AIDL file, we have the IAB helper Java class. There are a couple of convenience methods that you could use to launch the purchase flow to, and to complete the purchase transaction. The first one is checking if billing is supported. So it'll return whether it's supported or not. Next one is to get a list of all the purchases of that user. And you can also use get SKU details. SKU stands for stock keeping unit, which is a, a term to uniquely identify a product. So use that, and you would get a, a response of you know a, a, like a product ID with a list of its information. And then use get by intent to launch the purchase flow. And then finally, you start intent sender for result to get all of your purchase information. So your app is communicating with Google Play app using this. So we'll quickly go through a little bit of code on how this is done. Uh, once you establish the connection using the in-app billing service file, you can uh, check if billing is supported. The three over here shows if. Um, if it's version 2 or version 3. So make sure you're passing in 3 because version 2 is deprecated. The item type can be either, either in-app or subscription. And uh, if you get the response as OK, then that means billing is supported. Next is to check if, um, you know, just query if all of the users own products. 
surpassing three package name, which is the unique package name of your app, the item type, which can be in-app or subscriptions, and a continue token. Uh, Google lists all of, uh, uh, suppose you offer more than 20 products, like say 30 products, then Google lists 20 products first, and to get the next 10 products, you have to use the continue token. You can use get SKU details to get more information about a product. Again, use item type, and query SKUs is all the owned SKUs that you got in the previous method. Finally, to launch the purchase flow, use the get by intent uh, method, which is in launch purchase flow. Pass in the SKU, the, that is the product ID, the item type, which is in absence subscription. And once you do that, all of this information is retrieved in your pending intent. Use that pending intent uh, in your start intent sender for result. And um, this will talk to Google Play. Once Google Play gets this pending intent, it's going to return all the purchase response back to you. So you have to make sure that you have this method handle activity result in your main activity of your app. And um, the pending intent will return all of this information, response code, purchase data, and your data signature. Purchase data is a JSON. It has all of the information about your user's purchase. Response code is whether it's successful or not. And uh, data signature is a string that is, that, is used to, uh, that is used to sign the purchase data. So all of this so far we talked about was for managed products and subscriptions. Uh, what do you do if you want to use a consumable product? So for that case, you use the consume purchase call. And in, uh, for consume purchase, you pass in version 3, package name, and the token. The token is something that you get from the purchase data. It's a purchase token that uniquely identifies a given product and a user. So using this, you can make sure that a purchase is consumed successfully multiple times. So quick recap, just make sure on startup, if billing is supported, get a list of all of the user's products, get more information about the products on purchase, uh, for purchase, just make sure you launch the purchase flow using get by intent. And to complete the transaction, use handle activity result, and that's where you would get all of your purchase information. And if it's a consumable purchase, uh, make sure you're using the consume call to purchase it over and over again. This is what our purchase data looks like. Uh, it's a JSON. It has the order ID. The first half highlighted in yellow is unique to your merchant. And the second half is unique to that transaction. You can notice that this uh, dot dot zero, and that is for a subscription, which means it's recurring. So first time it uh, renews, the subscription is dot dot zero. Second time it renews, it's dot dot one. Third time it's dot dot two, and so on. So uh, the package name is the package name of your app. The product ID is whatever unique product ID you gave it. Purchase time, the time uh, when you bought it, it's in milliseconds. Purchase state can be 0, 1, or 2, which is successful, canceled, or refunded. Uh, the developer payload is a unique string that you, the developer, would pass along to the server. If the server returns the same string back, you know that there's nothing fraudulent happening. The purchase token is a token that is sent by Google. It uniquely identifies uh, a user and a given item pair. Finally, you have auto-renewing, which can be true or false, and it's only for subscriptions. So uh, if it's true, it means that it's still renewing. If it's false, that means either the user canceled it or you canceled it, you as in the developer. So you also have a signature and a response code that is returned with your purchase response. So next step, testing. Well, most of the testing here is on the client side. So you can go about testing this in two ways. First is using test purchases, where you add in licensed test users to your Google Play Console. And then you use a bunch of reserved product IDs that Google offers, so you can test it locally on your device. And you're not charged for it. Uh, on the other hand, you have regular purchases, where a user can just download your app from the Play Store. So you can put it up on Alpha or Beta channel. And then you use real product IDs, and you get actually charged for it. So you have to use a real credit card. So for both cases, you can publish on alpha, beta, or production channels. Now, um, this is how you would go about using uh, setting up licensed test users. Just go into Gmail, uh, just go into the settings and add in a Gmail account for that test user. Hit save. You can uh, 
you can decide in this drop down whether you want your server to respond normally or if you want it to say server failure or something like that. So these are the reserved product IDs. You have Android test purchased, canceled, refunded, and the last one, item unavailable, which means that this product is not set up or uh, maybe there's a typo in the product. So you can use any of these four to test your uh, workflow. So testing uh, for testing with reserve product IDs, make sure you have your in-app billing workflow set up in your app, sign your APK, and install it on a test device. You cannot test uh, in-app billing on emulators, just because emulators don't come with Google Play services, and you need to have a Google Play app to test in-app billing. So sign into your device with your developer account. Make sure you have these versions of Google Play or My Apps and Android 2.2 and above. Run your app and purchase the reserve product ID. If everything goes well, you should see a sample uh, title, and you should see this dialog which shows all of this fake information. And if you hit buy, it's going to show payment successful. So this is in the case of a test product, which is you know, the Android reserve product ID, which is Android test purchased. You can test it out with other reserve product IDs. The testing with actual product IDs is, is similar, except you have to go into Google Play Console and add a real product ID. Uh, so upload a signed APK to alpha beta channel. Uh, you can't use draft APKs anymore, which was uh, something that Google provided earlier. Draft APKs are when you could use the same version name and sign the APK. So if you uploaded uh, version 1.1 in draft, you could up, uh, make, some, make some changes and upload version 1.1 again. But you can't do that anymore. So every time you make some changes in your app, you have to upgrade the version to 1.2. So you have to use alpha or beta channel. Um, add a real managed product like we did before. Uh, choose a managed or subscription. That's up to you. Install the signed APK on a test device. You can't use emulators. Use uh, Make sure you have Google Play and um, Android 2.2. And purchase a real product with a real credit card. Um, and if you want to buy the same product again, you have to factory reset the device because Google thinks you own it. And uh, if you want to buy it again, it's like you already own this product, you can't buy it again. So one way to go about it is to factory reset the device. Another way is to create more fake products out on the Play Store. So testing subscriptions before Feb 2015, there was no sandbox. So there was no way for you to test with those reserved product IDs. You would just have to create a fake product and then purchase a product with a real credit card and then go onto Google uh, Wallet console and refund it. If you don't refund it, you lose 30% to Google again. So make sure you refund it and cancel the order and wait till the end of the subscription period. So it's a monthly, if it's a monthly subscription, you have to wait for a month. Um, either that or factory reset. It, or another option is to create yet another fake product and buy it to test it. So after Feb 2015, we uh, now have Android test purchase reserve product. You can buy the product, and you just have to wait for one day because of the local cache that Google has. And you can test the product, the subscription product. So this is what a valid subscription product purchase looks like. The dialog that you saw earlier for, was for a managed product. For a subscription product, it's going to say subscribe. So that's the major difference. It's also going to show you that uh, you are going to get charged 99 cents a month starting March 3rd. This is because I've uh, set up a seven day free trial option, which means the user probably bought this on Feb 24th. So between Feb 24th and March 3rd, the user can um, watch all of the premium content or do whatever with the premium features. But after March 3rd, the user is charged 99 a month. So when a user buys a product, usually Google Play Store sends an email saying you have bought a product with the transaction ID. You don't have to handle that. Here are some of the common errors that you would see when you set up an app billing. The first one is this version of the application is not configured for billing through Google Play, which means that the version you're testing on your device is probably different from the version that you have uploaded on the alpha or beta channel. So if you have 1.1 on your device, make sure you have 1.1 up there on your alpha or beta channel. The next one is your order was declined because it was considered high risk. This usually 
uh, shows up if you're trying to use the same credit card and multiple devices and trying to buy it over and over again. Google thinks you're doing something fraudulent, so it's going to say that it's high risk. You can all, uh, this is another tricky error. It says authentication is required, you need to sign in, but it doesn't actually convey what the real problem is. It could be maybe your product is null or you didn't, there is a typo on your product or some, something has been set up wrong. Okay, let's talk about security, the sixth thing you're going to learn today. The, this is mostly on the client side, but you can also do some of this on the server side. First thing, use ProGuard. It's a tool that lets you, uh, you know, rename all your classes, your uh, methods and other things so that it's not easy for people to, uh, uh, people to kind of mess around with your app and decompile your APK and see all of your information. So add in your, uh, this line into your ProGuard text file. Next step is make sure you protect all your premium content. If you are uh, giving access to users, giving premium access to certain content that you have on your app to your users, make sure you have a real-time service delivering some information that this user is premium. Don't try to store it in shared preferences or something local. Um, protect your Google Play public key. This is packaged with your app, so you want to make sure that you're doing some sort of string manipulation or uh, bit manipulation to something that would make sure that the, you, uh, anybody cannot access your public key. Uh, protect your, uh, sorry, modify the sample application code. A lot of, since you don't have a library or anything, you're just using a, a bunch of Java classes that Google provides, make sure you can, you modify it. Use the developer payload. This is the developer payload that is set by you, the developer. So if you're sending in a string, Google should return that same string back, which means that no, but there's no middleman trying to, uh, you know, do something fraudulent with your purchases. Finally, do some sort of signature verification on your client and server. Uh, for that, you need your base64 public key, which you can decode, and make sure that uh, the purchase uh, response, the purchase data that you have, was signed with that signature. And if that's true, you know that um, your purchase is not fraudulent. So we're coming to the last part of this talk, which is how do we go about implementing this on the server side? So you have some information about your user, you have purchase response and everything, but how do you go about um, figuring out more information about this user's purchase? For that, we're going to make use of Google Play Developer API, which is an API provided by Google um, that lets you get more information about your user's purchases. So heading back to our diagram again, we finished the first part on the left-hand side. So once you get your purchase response, which is your JSON, just send it over to your server so it's uh, stored somewhere. And you can use uh, some of the values in your JSON, uh, pass it to the Google Play Developer API, and it's going to return some response back, uh, like the end, end date of a subscription and so on. So why would you use Google Play Developer API? It's free, 200,000 queries a day. Uh, it also offers another API within that called the Publishing API, which lets you automate app distribution tasks like updating uh, your app or uh, you know doing some things with the alpha or beta channel. You can automate a lot of app distribution tasks. Then you have uh, Subscriptions and In-App Purchases API, which is relevant to our interests. So uh, using this API, we can get more information about our users' purchases. Remember that when a user buys a product, all the information that you have is the user's order ID. So you need to make sure that the purchase response reaches your server. So, so far we've talked about two consoles that we've used. The first console is your Google Play Developer console. The second one is your Merchant console. Uh, this is where you would see all of your user's transaction IDs. So all of the order IDs that we saw uh, earlier are going to show up there. There's yet another console that you would want to set up if you want to use Google Play Developer API. That is the API console. So go to this link, uh, this create an OAuth 2.0 client ID, and just basically set up the OAuth 2.0 workflow. It's beyond the scope of this talk, but uh, Google Play Developer API uses OAuth 2.0 authorization protocol, so just make sure you, sh you set that up. After you do all of that, you can access the API. So uh, here's a quick example. Just make sure you hit this uh, URL. Send in the package name, the product ID, and the token that you got from your purchase data. 
and you should get this response. This is showing what kind of purchase it is. It says it's a product purchase, which means it's a managed product. And then the purchase time in milliseconds, the purchase date, which is 0, 1, or 2, cancelled, refunded, uh, sorry, purchased, cancelled, or refunded. And then you have consumption state, which is 0 or 1. Uh, 0 means it's not consumed, and 1 means it's consumed. And then the developer payload, if you have set it, then the developer payload should show up here. The same thing with subscriptions, but instead of uh, the product ID, you're passing in the subscription ID, which is nothing but your order ID. So pass that in, package name, subscription ID, and your token. And you're going to get this information, what kind of purchase it is, the start time in milliseconds, and the expiry time in milliseconds, and whether it's order renewing or not. So uh, to set up your Google API, um, Google Play Developer API, uh, you don't have to you know, write everything from scratch. Google provides you a bunch of libraries in different languages. So based on what your server uh, is written on, you can choose any of Java, Python, .NET, PHP, or JavaScript. And there's also some uh, beta ones in Go and Dart and so on. So you can learn more about these uh, API client libraries at this link. So, um, the point of using this library is so that you don't have to write all of the OAuth code yourself. It just makes it a lot easier for you. So this brings us to the end of the talk. Here are some of the references. Uh, a good point, uh, starting point is the video from IO 2013 about in-app billing. And the rest of the links talk about the you know, administrative setup as well as how you would go about implementing it. That's it. If you have any questions, I'm here. You can ask me right now as well. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. The slides for this are available here. And we're also hiring a drama fever. So if you're interested, please go check out this link or come and talk to me. Thanks, everyone. I'm here for questions. <laughs>